Hi, this is Tony Williams, Senior Fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and we want to welcome you to another close read. This one will be on Theodore Roosevelt's New Nationalism speech. And it's our great honor to have our, an esteemed historian and friend of mine over at the College of the Sequoia, Stephen Toodle. Stephen, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, you're going to help us dig around in the new nationalism speech. So uh, I really appreciate it. You're an expert on American history, uh, specifically modern American history. So uh, we're uh, very honored to have you along to uh, offer your expertise uh, on this document and some of its background. Excellent. Can't wait. It was one of my favorites to, to uh, cover. And uh, hopefully we can uh, mix it up a little bit. Okay, let's dive right in, Stephen. And if you can provide uh, a little bit of background uh, for the viewers on the context of this speech uh, in 1910. Okay, well, um, the, Theodore Roosevelt um, was giving this speech at um, a meeting of veterans who were dedicating a, um, uh, a park to John Brown. Uh, so there are a lot of references in it to John Brown and the history of the Republican Party. And there's a deeper um, context with Theodore Roosevelt as well, who had spent his entire life in politics and in Republican politics. Um, then uh, after his split with Taft, uh, he feels like he needs to um, take his more traditional ideas and apply them to um, the challenges of America in in the what we kind of lumped together is the progressive era, um, and that is constant panics in the financial markets, um, the growth of corporations, and that in in terms of their size uh, dwarf anything that had ever existed in the world, and and. Um, this is also the era in which um, individuals were becoming much wealthier than anybody in history had ever become, especially in comparison to um, uh, the average working person. Um, massive industrialization, uh, um, in terms of the amount of wealth that was being created and the complexity of um, the companies that were being put together, products were being delivered more cheaply, more uniformly, and in higher quality than anything the world had ever experienced. In many ways, the, the challenges of the progressive era were uh, foreshadowing what would happen to the rest of the world as the kind of American system of um, uh, American economic system spread throughout the world. Uh, urbanization, again, it's this is, this is a trend that's only been accelerating since the progressive era, but people moving into cities for economic uh, opportunity. And then this is also a time of com almost completely open borders. So people pouring into the United States from all over the world. This is the time in American history with the highest level of immigration. And um, to use the term that he would have used at the time, uh, this is the time in American history with the highest number of what they called at the time hyphenated Americans, meaning Americans with at least one parent who was foreign born. And so as much as people think that immigration, uh, you know, increased in the night, we have these big waves that would happen in the 1980s or uh, maybe 10 ish years ago. Uh, no, it was it was at this time. And this is also a time of massive political participation. One of the, one of the most um, stark um, uh, other uh, you know, statistics to look at is you just have these massive increase of wealth, but you also have massive voter turnout. So we don't see voter turnout return to the levels of the progressive era, maybe until today, you know, uh, in the last election we're, we're starting to see some of those uh, voter turnouts matched the, the the heights of the progressive era. So um, that's just a kind of background to many of the things that were going on, but it led to this overall sense of, of chaos and crisis among the American people. 
Right. So rapid social economic change and, and thus calls for reform uh, from right. reformers and, like uh, T.R. and Woodrow Wilson and others. And when people ask, you know, which person uh, would have experienced the most social change, I always use Eisenhower as a uh, benchmark because he was born in 1890. But if you were someone who was born in 1890 and lived a relatively long life, you would be it's potential that you were born uh, into a pre-industrial setting that, and, and you died with a man landing on the moon and nuclear <laughs> weapons. So what people were going through in this period uh, was really unlike anything that any group of human beings any time in world history had ever gone through. Uh, totally unprecedented. Okay, so looking at the document here the, from the new nationalism, uh, you alluded to the fact that that he he channels some some John Br Brown, which is kind of interesting. Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, on the radical uh, end of things, uh, especially with the the massacre at, at Osawatomie. Um, but then also uh, refers to some Abraham Lincoln, which is not on the document here, uh, but but is in the speech, uh, not on the screen. Um, and so how does he talk about uh, Lincoln and, and labor? Oh, <clears throat> so one of the things that is, I mean, just to refer to the, what's in this, uh, the, the first lines that you just brought up, but uh, he immediately, uh, TR immediately frames his argument in terms of the long struggle for the rights of man. And that comes directly out of his understanding of all of the constitutional and legal and philosophical debates that come out of the Civil War period. And he considers this to be yet another struggle in the, for the uplift of humanity. And so he says, so again, he's, he's, he's trying, he's dealing with this contemporary crisis, but he's going back to history and trying to say to the American people, what we need is a deeper understanding of our founding principles and how they would apply to this crisis today. And so, he says, what we really want is, is very old, a triumph of real democracy that he'll define later, a triumph of popular government, and in the long run of an economic system under which each man shall be guaranteed the opportunity to show the best that there is in him. And both of these things are extremely Hamiltonian. He often described himself as a thoroughgoing Hamiltonian. And you'll notice that every time in this speech that he mentions uh, um, um, equality, or he will always throw the word equality of opportunity, and it's opportunity to show the best that is within you. So he's not talking about any kind of society where, and we'll see this later in the document too, where he says, I stand for the square deal, and that just means fairness. We want people to get what they have earned, uh, and that's gonna, but that will always result in inequality of condition. And that places him at odds with Woodrow Wilson's answer, which is to focus on equality of condition. That's, that's not what Theodore Roosevelt is saying. And that's not his, that's not his understanding of justice. And he says that, and then this next paragraph, he shifts the focus back and says, that's why uh, the, the history of America is now the central feature of the history of the world. This demonstrates that uh, he also understands Federalist One and American exceptionalism properly understood, which is the proper role of the United States is to serve as an example for the rest of the world that our democratic institutions still work, even facing this kind of, this kind of challenge. And so he says that's for the world has set its face hopefully towards our democracy. And, and then he puts the burden back on people as citizens saying that each one of you, and, uh, and he even uses those words, each one of you as an individual, not as a group, as an individual carries on your shoulders, not only the burden of doing well for the sake of your country, but the burden of doing well and seeing that this nation does well for the sake of mankind. So this is another difference that he has with Woodrow Wilson or, or many of the other socialist, uh, uh, or many of the socialist thinkers of the time who were trying to respond to these crises with other ideas. But he says, no, that, that you have to understand that, that the only way through this is by understanding that each of you is entitled to things as individuals, but every individual also has a burden. You have an individual responsibility to yourself 
and to your government. And it's a different understanding. It's not libertarianism, certainly, and it's not socialism, and it's not Woodrow Wilson. Right. Okay. Yeah, and in, in these next two slides, uh, he seems to be saying, you know, he, he talks about the special interests several times, and then he really sort of does seem to have that, that classic progressive vision of, of kind of the, the people versus the interests that the, the special interests, the corporations, you know, that they've manipulated politics and our free government and really kind of cheated the system uh, and, and herded sort of, uh, quote unquote, the little guy. Right. Uh, and, and do you see this vision? Absolutely. But I want to, again, make this distinction between what he was proposing and what socialists or uh, the Wilsonians were proposing. So you see in these next few lines, at, the, at many stages in the advanced humanity, this conflict between men who possess more than they've earned and men who have earned more than they possess is a central condition of progress. And he says, we have this, it, in our day, it appears as a struggle of the freeman. Again, you know, it's never far from his mind, the, the issues that had to be worked out in years after the Civil War. And to hold the right of self-government against a special interest, meaning the slave owner and the people who wanted to continue to oppress them and who would twist the methods of free government in order to defeat the popular will. And so he says, at every stage in all circumstances, the essence of the struggle is to equalize opportunity, not condition, opportunity, and destroy privilege, which he, and he later defines as, making sure that we always target unearned privilege. And he has, and he's, he's very careful to always make the distinction, which is something that Wilson would disagree with and say, no, 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 individuals aren't guilty of, of individual crimes. Uh, they just live under a bad system. And TR was always careful to say, no, we, what we wanna destroy is special privilege. What we wanna destroy is anybody who's taking advantage in order to deny someone else uh, justice. Look at the first line there. He says, practical equality of opportunity, <laughs> right? He always puts equality of opportunity. And, and, and then he's, he's, he points out what we want is to give every person a fair chance to make himself everything that in him lies, right? Reach the highest capacity. And then again, second, equality of opportunity means that you'll be able to carry this burden with you. But the, the, that's where you see him filling out those concepts. Yeah, sorry. Right. But, but and, I, yeah. and so it seems that the, uh, you know, the special privileges, these corporations, these monopolies are destroying that, that opportunity, uh, that, that equality of opportunity for ordinary Americans and small businesses and so forth. Well, they could be. And if they were doing it using an unfair advantage, that's where he would want to intervene. But, um, but he didn't think of success in and of itself as being a bad thing. This was another contrast with Wilson, right? Um, Wilson's basic argument was that big was bad. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt's argument is that big can be bad or big can be good. It depends on what they do. So if there is somebody who is successful in life and there's a corporation who's succeeding, but they're not doing anything wrong, leave them alone. But if they're doing something wrong, then we need to punish them, but we need to punish them under the old rules and uh, we don't need any new legal theories of governance in, in order to do so, in order to punish what is in essence bad behavior. Good. And so uh, we come to the uh, phrase square deal. Now, he had used this earlier when he was president, and, and this is after uh, his, uh, his um, term in office, and, and he's going to run again in, in 1912. Uh, and uh, what, is, what is the gist, what, what is the, the purpose of this square deal? I think you've already alluded to this quality of opportunity, uh, but what is the square deal for him? Well, he says that we, it's it's uh, he doesn't he does want some rules changes. He, he says, I, I mean, not merely that I stand for fair play under the present rules of the games, but I stand for having those rules changed as long as they work for a more substantial equality of opportunity, <laughs> right? Not of condition. Always careful to to. But he says one word of warning, which I think is, you don't need to say to the good people of Kansas, but you know maybe I need to say this to people who don't understand this. 
But he wants to make sure that people understand that part of freedom and part of equality of opportunity is you must be free to fail. And, uh, and he says, I do not mean that I want a square deal for the man who remains poor because he's not got the energy to work for himself. If a man who has had a chance will not make good, then he's got to quit. What we, what, we, what we all want is we want justice according to what American culture had always called justice, uh, which is justice for the brave man who fought, punishment for the coward who shirked his work. Um, and so uh, again, that's a, it's, a, it's a large contrast with what um, um, Wilson always argued, which is that these people who are caught up in this system um, it's not their fault. And thus what we needed was permanent regulation. And so um, the square deal was going to be specific targeted legislation, but it was targeted at specific ills in society. In other words, we're gonna use legislation to fix specific problems. And we're gonna also uh, use that legislation. We're gonna revisit it because we're going to change, we're going to constantly be passing new laws. Uh, uh, and that's not going to change, but at the same time, we don't necessarily need new laws or new powers for the executive in order to punish people who are engaged in bad behavior, but always with this idea that what we're going to, what the goal should be is something approximating what Americans would recognize as justice. So, uh, so he starts to dial in on what he means by that, or how we're going to achieve uh, the square deal. Uh, and and it, it's interesting here, he starts to get into some discussion about a, a, a thoroughgoing and effective regulation. So it, it seems to me that, and, and I think we'll see it on some other slides, that he is talking about some national regulation, especially in the executive branch, like the, the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Bureau of Corporations and, and some other regulatory agencies. Uh, and he says, we don't wanna be forced into the ownership of the railways if it can be avoided, but the, the alternative is some regulation. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, it, in many ways, it, it, it sounds very much like the debates that we're having now over the internet. You know, in many ways, the railways were the high tech commodity industry that was driving the American economy of the late 19th, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So uh, people view the railways much in the way that we view the tech giants. Um, and um, so it, people thought of the uh, railways the way that we think of Apple and Google and uh, Microsoft. So what Theodore Roosevelt is essentially doing here is firing this as a warning shot and, and saying, what we're going to do is we're going to use the old systems of government to really rethink what, what these are within the context of American society. So we understand that they are doing an interstate business, which means that this is within the purview of the federal government. But he says, I don't want to see the, na the nation forced into ownership of the railways if it can be avoided. And maybe we need to look into thoroughgoing and effective regulation. And, but we're going to do that based on a full knowledge of all the facts. This is, I know that in, it can seem very similar to what Wilson was talking about, but you can see time after time, all of these qualifications that Theodore Roosevelt is putting into it, his speech. And Wilson just has none of this. Wilson just says, we're going to do this. He already knows what the answer is. And so in each case, Theodore Roosevelt is taking this crisis and he's, he's forcing it back into the American system of government and saying that our existing institutions with our existing rules and our existing law, or most of our existing laws are already capable of handling this crisis. Uh, and uh, maybe we will need to have government ownership of the railroads. Maybe that's where we'll end up. But uh, before we do that, we're going to have a full knowledge of the facts. We're going to have a physical valuation of the property. And uh, if it is if determined through our democratic institutions that we need to take this over and we need to fix rates, then that will not be something that necessarily um, permanently alters the 
uh, the free market of the United States. It will just simply be uh, something that we regulate on a national level. There's a very important distinction that Republicans in the 19th century had to make about economics. And this is the point that he makes in the speech um, where he quotes Lincoln, um, where he makes sure to always put politics above economic interests. Sure. And it's a, it's a very important point that Republicans always felt like they needed to make in order to say, no, no, we understand that the political system of the United States and our representative institutions are supreme. And that means supreme to everything. <laughs> uh, everything else needs to be negotiated in this pluralistic system, but it's the, but it's the system that protects liberty for all Americans. And if that means that we need to balance um, the relationship a little bit between the free market uh, functioning uh, and um, uh, you know ownership of railroads or something. It's something that you do reluctantly and you only do it after it gets through the House and through the Senate and through the Supreme Court, which means it's probably not gonna happen. But uh, it's not something that you take off the table entirely because of the Civil War experience, we've already said that our democratic institutions are the most important thing. And uh, so he goes on to talk about um, you know, the good versus bad trusts uh, and uh, talking about um, not attempting to prevent such combinations because as you say, some, some can act in, you know, uh, can, can act good uh, and, and not break the laws and so forth. But he says in completely controlling them in the interests of the public welfare. Uh, and for that purpose, uh, as I said, the Federal Bureau of the Corporations, Interstate Commerce Commission, he's talking about sort of achieving that progressive goal of, of efficiency and social order uh, by, as he says, largely increasing their powers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it, and. So many, I mean, Theodore Roosevelt was such a smart guy and he had absorbed so many of these ideas. And so we see so much of his political theory in every sentence that he, that he says, just because he's absorbed this stuff so much. But so he says that combinations in industry are the result of an imperative economic law, which can't be repealed by political legislation. So the first thing to understand is that, 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 that we should, that this, these economic laws that we live under are, uh, this is going to happen. And unlike Woodrow Wilson, which is, says that we need, you know, we can control this. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt says, we can't control the people becoming successful, you know, I mean, without trampling on all of our liberties. So he says, the effort at prohibiting all combination has, has failed. And the way out lies not in attempting to prevent it, but, but completely controlling this in the interest of public welfare. And for that purpose, we need an agency that like the Bureau of Corporations. And he says, we need more powers for these two executive agencies. And um, I don't know if we would place all of the blame for the growth of the um, administrative state over the course of the 20th century belongs with Theodore Roosevelt or Taft as they conceived of or used the powers of the federal government. Um, I, I, because in so many cases, the what Theodore Roosevelt and what Taft actually did was only go after um, uh, combinations of or, or large businesses that were doing things that were um, widely perceived of or in actuality were uh, either angering the American people very much <laughs> or, um, uh, or actually hurting people. And in those cases, they, they wanted the executive departments and the court system to have the powers to punish people who were guilty of crimes. And in, in some cases they needed 
more powers and more authorities, more authority uh, in order to do that. And so I think uh, one of the other public education elements here is that Roosevelt was able to tell a crowd of progressives who wanted to cheer him on that um, we're, go we're going to do this. We're, we're, we're going to go after the big baddies and we're going to go after them with a big stick and don't you worry about it. Um, and he would throw out a phrase like we're going to, you know, completely controlling them in the interest of the public welfare. Well, that, that could sound a little bit scary to give an executive agency that kind of authority. But, uh, but then he followed it up immediately with a description of the tool he was going to use and um, uh, it, that was a combination of both specific and vague. Uh, we're going to use the Federal Bureau of Corporations and the Interstate Commerce, but but how he's going to do it is effectively in a law enforcement uh, capacity. So we're going to we're going to still treat these as crimes. And he seems to have, uh, you know, in in this slide, uh, he starts uh, to. Talk about his understanding of, of property and wealth, um, and I think in in the next slide, uh, maybe even sort of a little clearer, where he says that um, you know he talks about excessive wealth and so forth, and and maintains that uh, that the the public, uh, the community, can regulate its use, uh, can regulate property, can regulate wealth. Um, in the public welfare. Um, and so uh, how does that, that fit into to Roosevelt's uh, understanding? Well, I mean, again, I, I would say you got to keep returning to a lot of the debates of the 19th century that give the basis of, of what we would call, uh, of what people now call capitalism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what, what, we were, what they were really describing in the 19th century was, was freedom. Let's just call it freedom. You don't need the word capitalism. But what this means is, is the individual right to earn, spend, keep, live a free life. And what that means in a society where you have to protect the rights of other people. Uh, and, and, and how do these things apply? So how do those lessons of the that we just learned <laughs> or were forced to learn because of the crisis of the Civil War. How do these apply to this new crisis? And, and so that man who wrongly holds that every human right is secondary to his profit must now give way to the advocate of human welfare who rightly maintains that every man who holds his uh, property subject to the general right of the community to regulate its use to whatever degree the public welfare may require it. Now, I, again, this this stuff only makes sense in it's it's sort of interesting because of how people misunderstand what capitalism is. But you know, free markets can only exist in a free society. Uh, capitalism is the absence of violence. So capitalism is nothing more than 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 peace, right? It's we are not going to use violence in order to force you to uh, to work or shop or buy or sell anything you don't want to buy or sell. In order to have that level of freedom in society, you must first dedicate yourself to keeping as your first priority a system of ordered liberty. And that is thoroughly Hamilton's understanding of the ordered liberty that was set up under the Constitution of the United States. And so when Theodore Roosevelt is stating what would be obvious to everyone, because everyone who had spent the last 80 years saying that the property claims of slave owners is secondary, is, is of secondary importance to the right of this individual person, the slave, <laughs> to, to keep his own labor to, uh, to live a free life. So if this is not contrary to capitalism, it's not, or what, I hate the word capitalism because it, it, throw, it messes us all up, but this is not contrary to the ideals of freedom that we just settled in the 19th century. This is freedom. Understanding that, that economics uh, and your economic system is one of your freedoms, but 
economic freedom is not the only freedom that you have. And one person's economic freedom, uh, you're economically free up until the part where your economic freedom interferes with my economic freedom. And then it is the role of politics, the peaceful negotiation and society to uh, settle those issues. But, and, and so I, I guess I'm wondering here where you talked about the right to regulate the use of wealth and the public interest is universally admitted. I mean, I'm not sure it was universally admitted, um, just in the sense of what if a an industrialist made hundreds of millions of dollars, but but did so, um, you know, in a in a lawful way, uh, just by building a very successful corporation. Uh, and um, you know, and then would turn around and was very philanthropic with it um, and, you know, benefited the community. Would the, would the government or the state then have, the public then have the right to regulate that person's wealth in the public interest? Well, in, in Theodore Roosevelt's case, when he says things like that, he's essentially taking Hamilton's case in the Bank of the, of the United States. Uh, he's taking McKinley's position in tariffs. And that is to say that we, we've already said, and we already understood, or Lincoln, when Lincoln was advocating for canals, you know, these disastrous canals in Illinois, right? That these things that the government does will have implications with regards to personal wealth of, of Americans. And, and, and when it is something that is, uh, involves uh, interstate commerce, this will be done at the federal level. And so he's taking the Hamilton, Lincoln, McKinley, and continuing that understanding of the regulation of or, or government action that will affect the the wealth. Of, I mean, or you know, when when Republican politicians grant and are are um, settling civil war debt, the, this is another way that they are. Um, affecting the personal wealth of millions of Americans through a political process. So, so in that sense, within the Republican tradition, he would say, if this is already, we've already cr crossed that many times over. And now let us admit also the right to regulate the terms and conditions of labor, which is the chief element of wealth directly in the common interest of the common good. But this is one that, I don't know, maybe I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Do you think he's seeing more, this more as a continuation and saying we need to take this one step further? Um, well, well, I think that he, I mean, the, you know, during the progressive era, there was an awful lot of labor legislation that was regulating the terms and conditions of labor, whether uh, working hours, uh, minimum wages, uh, laws were passed, uh, factory conditions and sort of safety regulations and so forth. So, you know, I think, I think he does see in a very expansive role for the state, not only in, in corporate regulation, but then also in, you know, sort of what's going on on the factory floor, um, yeah. you know, in the interests of, of workers and, and the, the common good, as he calls it. Right. Well, I think we're, we're running out of time, but uh, I wanted to dial in a little bit as we, as we wrap up here um, on, on the new nationalism, uh, because, uh, you know, he, he seems to say that his, his very national outlook puts the need before section or, or localism, uh, personal advantage, or maybe what we might call individualism. Um, and, uh, you know, he says later on in that paragraph, regards the executive power as the steward of the public welfare. Uh, so sort of seeing, uh, at least the way I'm reading it, um, you know, this new nationalism is going to see a, a much larger role, you know, for the national government and for the executive branch, uh, rather than maybe, uh, and maybe to contradict some of your earlier statements, but, you know, sort of the, you know, these, these new powers are going to supersede some of the older ways of doing things because of the sort of necessity of, uh, and needs of the, the, this new age, right, this new industrial age with all of its rapid social and economic change. So uh, is that how you're reading it or maybe a little differently? No, I, I mean, I don't disagree with it. I think that in most cases, though, the, calling it the new nationalism for, for him was really 
him saying, we just need to remember the old nationalism. Okay. Um, and so we have these new challenges, but the way to solve these new challenges is to go back to how we worked these things out in the past. You know, how did we work things out with uh, the Bank of the United States? We learned some lessons there. Uh, the, the compromises with private property, with tariff law, um, the debates over slavery and individual and private property and the, the relationship between states and the federal government. And what he's saying is we need a, we need a rethinking of, of, of all of this stuff. Uh, yes, the executive power as the steward of the public welfare, the, a judiciary interested in primarily in human welfare rather than property. Uh, but he's not saying we need to invent new things. We just need to look at these new challenges in light of what we've already learned. Um, and so just as the demands of the representative body shall represent all the people rather than any class or section of the people. And this is, I can't help but read these things as an echo of the arguments that Republicans were making in the 19th century about why the federal government had the right to regulate slavery. <laughs> and what Theodore Roosevelt is saying in almost every one of these cases is we've already settled these arguments because we had all these arguments over slavery. We just need to apply those same legal principles and understand that just like we were saying no class of people in the United States got to have a dict dictatorial power over the entire rest of the country, we're saying the same thing about people who just ha who happen to have gi giant piles of money or our corporations. We, we just need to apply those old principles to the challenges of today. Uh, Stephen Trudel, uh, we thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, from the College of the Sequoias uh, and for all that you do for BRI. Well, thank uh, and thank you for joining us, uh, members of the viewing audience. Uh, our primary source close reads come out every other Thursday. Uh, come back in, in two weeks for another close read on Frederick Douglass. Thank you. Thank you.